about Steven Weinberg a little bit. You feel free to chat and everything like that uh, during this segment. Oftentimes I like to take segments from stream and put them on YouTube. So if you haven't followed me, exclamation mark YouTube Can to get someone that. someone experience pride and hate at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, but I want to talk about Steven Weinberg a little bit. Steven Weinberg is uh, an absolute legend uh, of the physics field who uh, passed away on Friday, very, very late at night. Um, I think he was 88 years old. Someone can fact check that. How old was Steven Weinberg? When, I think he was 88. 88, cool. Um, but he had a giant legacy that all kind of started with like one giant unification, right? And the giant unification came from, people often compared it to unifying electricity and magnetism and optics, right? The, th the work of Maxwell, the Maxwell's equation. And it was because of kind of the events that led up to it. So we're going to talk today about the events that led up to the discovery of electricity and mag or of uh, electro electromagnetism and, uh, and the weak force and what that was like and what, what the physicists were going through, but also Steven Weiberg's contribution to that because this was kind of like the kickoff. I don't want to say the kickoff because his career was already well and going by then. But he, uh, but he graduated with a PhD in 59, I think, and then four years later releases this paper that ultimately just changed the face of physics and was kind of like the starting point to the, um, starting point to the standard model, really. Uh, so let's kind of lay out what was going on with all of this, uh, with all the happening. So let's, let's start by talking a little bit about QED, quantum electrodynamics, right? The... This was mostly built up through like the 1930s, roughly. Um, I want to say by the middle of the 30s, they had a pretty good idea of everything with quantum electrodynamics, if not before the 30s. The, <coughs> I want to say the biggest problem with quantum electrodynamics, the divergences in the uh, perturbation theories and the higher order diagrams or whatnot, uh, really came to a head in the l end of the 40s with the work of Freeman Dyson who connected Feynman's work and Schwinger's work, Tomonaga, uh, and really laid down the first steps of a renormalizable theory. So in 1930s, um, it was pretty much finished, <sighs> but it wouldn't be a highly usable until... Uh, the late 1940s, when it would be kind of like done. I think it was late 1949, uh, Dyson kind of finished it off. And even with the 30s, um, even with the 30s, there was great things being done, like Dirac's uh, theory of the electron, a uh, relativistic theory of the electron, which included the positron, right? I have a uh, video on YouTube about that. Um, a video series on YouTube of uh, uh, shorts about how Dirac, you know, how Dirac came up with the antiparticle and uh, is the, what, what does the antiparticle even mean? Does it mean negative mass? Which of course it doesn't, so how do we talk about that? So I've explained that on the YouTubers. And, uh, but it also did things like it measured the magnetic moment of the electron, right? So this QED was really, really strong in the 30s. Um, and did all sorts of great work. Now, the weak force has some interesting origins. And really, it kind of started in, as early as 1896 um, with, ooh, I'm going to butcher this, Becquerel. Nope, C first. Becquerel. Um, who noticed that in the beta decay, there is a problem of energy conservation. Hello, Mark. Good to see you. Uh, and <clears throat> how, did, how did this manifest itself? So, like, suppose you had, like, a neutron coming in. Well, what would you find coming out would be, like, a proton and an electron, right? And there's a problem with that is that the, the, that the energy is not conserved, right? So... When we ever we see this energy conservation, that always kind of like, you know, it gives us uncomfortable feelings. <laughs> and eventually we want to have some, uh, you know, 
uh, re reconciliation to the fact that the energy is not conserved. So what did, what did we do? Well, it wasn't until 1931, Pauli, Wolfgang Pauli, suggested neutrinos as another particle, a near massless particle, and that was the key. That was the key. I don't remember the neutron. Is it? It should be what? Anti-neutrino? Electron neutrino? Anti-electron neutrino? I can't find it. Uh, Anti-electron neutrino. I think it's anti-electron neutrino. Someone can, I'm pretty sure that's right. We're going to go with that. <laughs> if that's wrong, someone can tell me. Um, the benefit of doing it live. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's anti-electron uh, anti neutrino. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so Pauli suggested that there was another near massless or massless particle, which, of course, we didn't know that neutrinos had mass until, what, 60 plus years later uh, that we found out that neutrinos did have mass. Uh, and then, uh, and then, but that wasn't quite enough, right? We needed more. So Fermi, in 1933... He laid down Fermi's theory. Oops. Missing some letters. Fermi's theory. Which had a rough outline that kind of looked like this, the Hamiltonian. Uh, and there was Fermi's number, which was GF over root 2. Um, and now we got to some interesting thing, which is this is a vector current, a vector charge current. And the interesting thing that, about this that Fermi introduced is the fact that up until now, we did not have a, <clears throat> up until Q, with QED, we did not have one particle that was allowed to go into a different particle. But with this, we have, what do we have? It's an anti-electron neutrino. Thank you, Mark. I thought so. I was, I was quite certain. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, right, so now with J, we have this weird thing that's a vector charge current, and it, it allows one particle to change into another particle and vary by a degree of charge, right? So that's kind of wild now. Up until then, we always had these particles that would, um, you know, you could have an electron positron was a big thing going on, right, where you have a, an electron and a positron. And then a photon would come out of the other side. And this was, you know, you could do all sorts of, of calculations with this. But we didn't have anything that would change one particle into another, like an electron into an electron neutrino or an electron neutrino into an electron. Uh, but now we did with this, uh, with this charge. So let's talk about the shortcomings of Fermi's theory. Because Fermi's theory, like you might say, okay, well, now we have a mathematic formalism to handle it. But hold on. It wasn't so simple. Like Fermi's theory was nice, but we had some issues, especially with high energy divergences. Low energy stuff was great. We got all sorts of low energy, um, <clears throat> low energy calculations done. But with Fermi's theory, the high energy, I'll just leave it down there. Maybe it'll be helpful later. <clears throat> the high energy, uh, we couldn't get it. It was too many divergencies, uh, divergences. And basically Fermi's theory, uh, it did not, it broke unitarity, which means it didn't have conservation of, of probabilities. What, what, what do you mean by conservation of probabilities? Well, quantum mechanics is probabilistic. Each time an interaction happens, uh, you know, it's going to happen under some probability, and all probabilities of all possibilities have to add up to one. And that's unitarity, and <clears throat> Fermi's theory broke that. Now, you know, what's so special about unitarity? You know, we have our reasons for believing it, like... Uh, and the fundamental level, you would imagine that, you know, probabilities have to add up to one. But there's some other things that we'll talk more about that. But we'll wait to talk to that, about that in the, the, uh, the quantum computing lesson when we have our next one. Because we're going to talk about measurement gates, which break unitarity, but very purposefully. So anyways, this fact that it broke unitarity was a problem. <clears throat> but, wait, there's more. So, Fermi's theory broke unitarity. Then, 1935. 1935, we have Yukawa. 
who comes along and says, there could be an intermediate vector bosons. Oh, that was the other thing about Fermi's theory. Fermi's theory, the Feynman diagrams look like this, where you had like a neutron here, right? And then proton, electron, and electron antineutrino with no type of intermediate boson. Now, okay, now that's a problem, right? Is that neutrino non-dairy? This, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> uh, but like that, so that's a problem, right? Is that this had to happen at the same space. Like it had to be an overlap of wave function. They couldn't have some intermediate thing. So Yukawa came along in 1935 and said, okay, we need to, you know, we need to, is there a way where we could actually introduce an intermediate vector boson that would do the same thing, uh, like change charge and change one particle to another particle and whatnot. And he really introduced a particle that became the W. Now, I, this part was a little bit strange to me, um, but like, I don't know if Yukawa did it or if Schwinger did it in 1957. But it, it, was until, it wasn't until 1957 before this became like a realistic, usable, um, Yukawa's work became realistic and usable. Um, so I'm not 100% sure when the W boson was actually introduced. Some sources said some different things. But, the, uh, but it became usable and fully functional in 57 by Schwinger. And I think that, uh, <coughs> I think that leading up to it was, um, there was a lot of, of work done on Yukawa's theory. Like, uh, Airsoft is here. Hi, Airsoft. Like, uh, when was the abelian uh, gauge groups done? That was later, right? That was the 50s. No, it must have been earlier. Was it the 50s? Nevertheless, we have these new intermediate bosons, so we can at least look like something <coughs> that becomes more familiar to us, where we have uh, an intermediate boson that connects the two branches of our, uh, of our beta decay. Um, but it still didn't fix the problem of high energy divergences. And then we get finally to the unification, right? Now we're into the unification. And <coughs> the unification, started in 1961 by Sheldon Glashow. Ooh, I don't know if I'm spelling his name right. Glashow. Uh, so Glashow proposed a symmetry group, SU2 cross U1, which had very large, very significant roots in particle physics, um, and that these different groups um, are basically the symmetries that the group must follow. So if you wanted to think about, you know, what does this actually mean? Well, you'd say a field or a particle uh, and an interactions in those particles. All of those things have Show to be subject. Glass show. I spelled it right. Cool. I don't know why I'm doubting myself so much with this. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you wanted to know what it was, it'd be like saying like that this is this contains all the symmetries that are associated with a certain group. And those symmetries, including things like the poly matrices and things like that, right? Those are obviously very important for this stuff, so they are within this group of, of symmetries. And the um, and this is the symmetry group that the that the particles must follow. When they did that, they found that there was extra vector bosons. Namely, there was a neutral W boson and a neutral B boson. Okay? And what could happen is they could actually combine these in a linear superposition uh, where you could recover the photon, which was interesting, um, as well as, uh, so linear combination. And what you would get would be the neutral Z and the A, which the A is for the boson, or the photon, excuse me. Um, but again, we still had some problems. Right? Like, this was great and all, but it was not gauge invariant. And <coughs> the A field is a gauge field. So, what does that mean for renormalization? Well, that means that the, the, the fields didn't renormalize. And we would still get some, ultra, or some, some high energy divergences. So, we finally get to the, 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 the hero of the story, 1967. Steven Weinberg. And 1968, independently, uh, I think it was Abdul Salam. Uh, I looked up 
I could not find a good, <laughs> I wrote Salam. <laughs> Salam, I looked it up. I couldn't find an accurate date for Salam's paper, but I th saw the earliest was 1968. And Weinberg's was published in October of 1967. We're gonna take a look at it in a second. Let's see here, Nanabelian Gage group was the 50s, I think. 54, awesome, cool, cool. Um, okay, so the, so we did need this gauge invariance to prove and make sure that it was renormalizable, and Weinberg and Salam introduced a very important concept, and that was the Higgs mechanism. Oops. I don't know why I put an apostrophe there. <laughs> the Higgs mechanism. Um, the Higgs mechanism was what was the last step they needed that allowed um, the Higgs is this permeating field and uh, that's everywhere and some particles interact which gives them um, their fundamental mass and with adding this element, taking SU2 and drafting the portions that needed to be done with the Higgs mechanism, you could actually get massive intermediate bosons, so now W plus, W minus, and Z neutral all have mass, they're all massive and we can get the effective mass that's necessary for the renormalization scheme. Now, here's the fun part. <laughs> and I, I remember watching a conference where Steven Weinberg was talking and his wife roasted him so bad. <laughs> Skip over Higgs. I know the Higgsy boys. Listen, listen. I know the Higgs were important. There's a lot of very important things that happened in this section, right? Between 1931, when we had that proposal for neutrinos, to 1967, when Weinberg published the first paper, uh, or the paper that kind of like tied it all together, SU2, U1, and the usable realistic theory. And I skipped a lot of it. V a lot of very important things, like the Higgs. <laughs> uh, Steven Weinberg's Mathematica software is really great too. What? Wait a second. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, his his uh, so Stephen Weinberg was talking about a time where, and he was he's he was a brilliant speaker. Uh, if you never got a chance to hear him speak, you should look up some stuff on YouTube from him because he's a brilliant speaker. But he's talking about how his wife roasts him so bad because at the end of this paper, okay, 1967, huge, right? <coughs> Stephen Weinberg does this. Ready? Oops, go away. Does this, ready? Here we go. Is this model renormalizable? Now up to this point, he's just been talking about having a model, right? That is now gauge invariant, which is necessary for renormalization because you need to worry about effective mass and vacuum energy expectation Weinberg values. Went to Costco. <clears throat> yeah, maybe, St Steven Wolfberg. <laughs> Okay, um, so this is what Weinberg says in the end of this 1967 paper, and it goes, is this model renormalizable? And we, we usually do not expect non-abelian gauge theories to be renormalizable if the vector meson's mass is not zero. Our Z mu and uh, W mu mesons get their mass from spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, not from a mass term put in at the beginning. Indeed, the model Lagrangian we start from is probably renormalizable. <laughs> he didn't even do it! He didn't even renormalize it. Renormalize it. Um, and he said something along the lines of like, his wife and him were at like a grocery store or something. I'm going to butcher the story, but you can probably find it on YouTube. Uh, his wife and him were at a, a grocery store or something, and, and they were talking about phys physics, and his wife said something, <laughs> said something along the lines of at least he, such, I don't remember who it was, because at least he renormalizes his own theories. And I was, I mean, I was dying, because that's just so funny to me. It was a completely different mentality back then, where like if you wanted to have a theory, and wanted to have a theory set in stone, you needed to have it completed, including renormalized and everything. Uh, it took five years. It took five years. It took uh, Herard de Hooft and Veltman uh, to actually renormalize SU2 cross U1, but regardless, it was, it was, it's all, like, it's all amazing and pretty brilliant. Um, Steven Weinberg himself had a huge con contribution. That was when his, like, big contribution started. He just kept pumping them out after that. I mean, he had lots of, lots of work done for renormalization. 
uh, combining. He named the standard model. Uh, yeah, it was like he has all sorts of, of brilliant contributions done. He was a, an absolute legend. Um, and it was uh, it, it was very tragic that he's gone now. Uh, he was one of the physicists that I really, really hoped to meet and have a conversation with at some point. Um, but nevertheless, uh, truly a brilliant man. Not to mention his yeah, his books were amazing. The first three minutes. We're going to be so uncouth, as you too. <laughs> so uh, I always recommend the first three minutes to so many people um, when they when they come asking for like book recommendations that are not too mathy but are, are not too pop sci. Um, and the first three minutes is fantastic for that that field. It's short. I think I read mine in maybe a single sitting, maybe twice. Um, but it's a short book and it's filled with so many great things.